Once upon a time, a U.S. Navy ship was transiting the high seas, time of war, and the ship ran over a mine and a big boom, and the ship started to sink slowly. Over the loudspeaker of the ship, you could hear, abandon ship, abandon ship, all hands go to your abandon ship stations. Abandon ship, abandon ship, all hands go to your abandoned ship stations. This is not a drill, this is not a drill. Land bears 090 to starboard, that way. 4,000 yards, two miles. I repeat, land bears 090 to starboard, 4,000 yards. One more time, land bears to starboard, 090, 400 yards. A young recruit had a big sign of terror. The ship was sinking slowly and most people were getting in the lifeboats and it well, didn't appear to be much damage but much uh, chaos and, and didn't appear like anybody was going to get wet. But he was very scared. Green recruit. And he walked up to the captain and he says, excuse me sir, we have a problem. He says, what's that son? Well, once we get to land, how are we going to handle all those bears? <laughs> oh come on, it's funnier than that. God, talk about bears. It's a sermon title for crying out loud. <laughs> the question I want to pose today is, how should a Christian respond to the idea of war and military service? A famous Civil War quote is that war is all hell. And if that's the case, it is like an angry bear. And so like that green recruit of my lame joke, we might ask, how are we to handle that bear? Well, some may say, some Christians, we often call them pests. Some may feel that the followers of Jesus are supposed to be peacemakers. And so we are to avoid war and military service at all costs. Others might say that Jesus calls us to be instruments of his justice and protection in the world. So God may call some of us to serve in the military and one day we may have to go to war to establish that justice. So a Christian, legitimately, may be torn between the issues of mercy and peace on one hand and justice and security on the other. What would God have his people to do when it comes to war and military service? How should we handle that bear? Well, what guidance do the scriptures give? Well, some committed Christians who are opposed to war and military service might quote texts such as Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. These are from the teachings of Jesus himself. Or how about Matthew 5, 39. Do not resist the evil one. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek. So those who hold this view would say, that war and military service are something to be avoided by a Christian. Often they're called conscientious objectors. Other Christians would disagree with this point of view. They would say that war is sometimes necessary to promote nations threatened by aggressors or to maintain peace in a troubled area of the world. They might point to such texts as what we read today, Amos chapter 1. Here we read a series of oracles that accuse various ancient nations of acts of gross injustice against other peoples. Here God speaks of the need for justice in the world. The prophet says, for three transgressions, even for even four, concerning the policies of the nation of Tyre, they stabbed people of Edom in the back. They ignored a peace treaty with them. They sold them into slavery. Or concerning the policies of the nation of Edom, they pursued their brothers with the sword. Or concerning the policies of the nation of Ammon, how they tortured pregnant women and children just so they might enlarge their borders and increase their power. And in this text, God's outrage over these injustices moves him to judgment. He says, I will send fire upon their walls to devour their strongholds. Their kings and their princes will go into exile. Could that fire possibly come from a U.S. cruise missile? 
This point of view would assert that God desires justice for all peoples, and when such injustices exist, we as Christians, his people, as his agents in the world, are justified in fully supporting a just war to protect any people who cannot protect themselves. So which part of the Bible should we quote from? Which course of action would God have us take? Should we avoid war and military service at all costs? Or should we be willing to serve and go to war if necessary? How should we handle that bear? The fact of the matter is this, that no single clear teaching of scripture would tell us in black and white how to do this. Issues of war and injustice are never black and white. They're always gray. There's perhaps in our past good wars and maybe bad wars. There's no real one solution. But I think there is a third passage of scripture that gives us a little more clarity concerning the question of war and military service. This is the story of Jesus, we read it today, being tested by the Pharisees over the issue of paying taxes to Caesar. They ask him, teacher, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we support the Roman government and their policies or not? And as we all know, this is a trick question. Jesus says, if he says, why of course we should pay our taxes, then the Pharisees have him, for then he would be siding with the oppressive policies of the Roman Empire. But if Jesus says, no, we shouldn't pay, the Pharisees still have him, for he could be accused of treason and not supporting Roman policies. And so Jesus' dilemma that's been posed to him is also our dilemma as we look at the question of Christians supporting war and serving in a military that is trained to go to war. Should we avoid paying our taxes to speak out and speak out against warfare and military service? Or should we go ahead and pay them and serve in our military and perhaps fight in a war? And as we all know, Jesus took neither of these options. He said, in effect, life is not as easy as that. Life is complicated. Things are not always clear cut. Life demands a balance. We are to render to Caesar what is Caesar's, at the same time, we are to render to God that which is God's. In this life, we are to give service and support to two kingdoms. The kingdom of Caesar, where we live physically, and the kingdom of God, where we live spiritually. But how do we do that today in our modern world? As Americans, how do we handle that bear today? Well, rendering to God is clear enough, I think. He deserves our love, devotion, service. He calls upon us to be agents of mercy and justice in the world. That's how we render to God. We do that most of the time. But what about rendering to Caesar? <coughs> Living in America today, we need to understand that our Caesar is different than the Caesar of Jesus' day. Our Caesar is not a president or administration or a Congress. Our Caesar is a special document which spells out a form of government of a free society. It's called the Constitution of the United States. To be sure, it's not a Christian document, it's a secular document. Many Christians had a hand, of course, in writing it and adopting it. But faith in Jesus is not a part of it and is not mentioned in it. But the essential ideas contained in it about freedom, how to go about allowing freedom to flourish, I think, are in part God's ideas about the need of every human government to set free the human spirit. I don't think our Constitution is about God, but I think he rejoices in it anyway. And one of the key ideas in this document is the Second First Amendment, really. Everyone has a right to assembly and free speech. That means that folks have the right to gather, protest, speak their mind, to engage in political debate, to agree or disagree with their government on important issues, yet at the same time, to respect the opinions of others, and even to fight for the right of another to have an opinion which is opposed to theirs. In the USA today, if we are to render to Caesar what is Caesar's, then we must respect and support our political system and all those who engage in its debates, as well as to the military structures which support our nation and its policies all over the world. With all prayer and godly wisdom, we are to decide for ourselves which direction we and our country should take concerning a war and respect the views of those who think the opposite. So if we take Jesus' teaching seriously about rending to Caesar, 
it would seem to me that in the United States today, there are two ways we might respond legitimately to the question of, a rec of Christians and war and military service. Each one, I think, is just as valid for a committed Christian as the other. In fact, I think there's more than one way to handle that bear. On the one hand, after prayerful consideration, we may feel that war is wrong and military service is not needed. God is opposed to us, and so a Christian should not support it. And if this is where we come out on the question of war, then it's okay under our Constitution to render to Caesar by speaking out against that war. But when we speak out, well, as we render to Caesar, we also render to God. So that when we speak out, we don't break the law. We don't undermine the morale and service of the men and women who serve us. And I think it's possible to do both. I remember during the, first, the last stages of the Vietnam War, I was an NROTC student uh, at Penn State. And there were protests. We'd go from class to class. There'd be protests on the streets and the aisles. Lots of protests. I never saw any, but you'd have to wear your uniform to go to class, military service class, whatever it might be. I remember one day I was walking from one end of campus to the other. There was a big protest. I avoided it by ducking down a corner, <laughs> going around a corner. But I had a friend who was an Air Force ROTC, and it, he didn't. They threw stuff at him. They called him a baby killer. And that really bugged me. Does to this day. They had every right to stand there and protest. God love them. They were protesting and standing up and had the courage to do so. But they had no right to hurt those who were serving. And so it is possible to protest a war, to protest warfare, and still support people who might be engaged in it. Those who serve us are our sons and daughters. They are some of the best we have. They deserve our support regardless of our views about the correctness of a given war. We need to avoid the name calling with respect to those who are waging the war. We need to respect our administration. We need to pray for our president and Congress in time of war, even if you didn't vote for him. We need to speak against the war and any other issue for that matter, as we're in a serious debate, not as if we're in another episode of professional wrestling. This is how a Christian in the USA today, I think, should respond to a war that they think is wrong by rendering unto God and rendering unto Caesar both at the same time. On the other hand, again after prayerful consideration we may feel that sometimes war is justified and military service is necessary. So in this case, how would we render appropriately to God and Caesar? Three things. First, in time of war we should begin by rendering to God. We need to get on our knees and mourn and ask forgiveness. War is not a football game where both teams make up and shake hands and go home at the end. War is a terrible, ferocious bear that can ruin peoples and nations. If we support a war, we must realize that a lot of people, mostly innocent people, will die. And so in all humility, we should pray for those people and ask God forgiveness should we or the military effort we support take their lives. Second thing, as we render to Caesar our Constitution, we need to respect the views of those who do not support war. Under our Constitution, it is just as patriotic to oppose a war as it is to support a war. Rendering to Caesar means, among other things, allowing the other side to have their say. If done correctly, this need not undermine the war effort or our troops' morale. And thirdly, we need to render to God to pray for God's wisdom to be with our president and administration. Pray that they will be led by the issues of justice and compassion and not give in to the temptations of exacting revenge or abusing military power. So I think that is how a Christian should render to God and Caesar if they feel war and military service are sometimes needed in our troubled world. And then there's something else that both sides can do. As Christians, there are three things we can all do together about handling that bear. 
regardless of our stance on a given war or military service, as we render to God and to Caesar. We can pray for our troops and their families, especially those who are prisoners of war, that they are able to serve with honor and perhaps, if necessary, to die with honor, that they never feel alone, that they know we are behind them, whether or not we're behind their cause, 100%. And the next thing we should do as followers of Jesus is very difficult. But God calls us to pray for our enemies and those who persecute us. When's the last time you prayed for someone running ISIS? Pray for God's spirit to work even in the hearts of the leaders of the people we are fighting, that the war might end swiftly and peacefully, and that peace might last. Pray for the bear that we might face. And finally, in Christ Jesus, we can be proud. Not because we're waging a war in which we have a great military and we're going to be victorious. There's nothing to be proud about in that. But we can be proud that we live in a nation where everyone can speak their mind. We can pr be proud that we possess so many fine men, young men and women, who would have the character to stand up and protest a war they oppose. And at the same time, we can be proud that we possess so many fine young men and women who will be willing to serve and perhaps die not only for your safety and mine, but for the safety of a people they don't even know. How should a Christian in the USA today respond to the concept of war and military service? How should we handle that bear? By rendering to God and at the same time rendering to Caesar and respecting those who may not agree with us as we do. I recall an interview, this was in 2003, the day before we invaded Iraq. Remember that? All of the embedded reporters were out and our, uh, one of our main military forces was based in Kuwait and they were going to go north towards Baghdad. And we figured the invasion was going to be the next day. That night, uh, a reporter found a Marine sergeant. He was up, he couldn't sleep because he knew war was coming. So he interviewed him was on tape, aired the next day, and the interview was most enlightening. This Marine sergeant confessed he was a Christian. And they asked, well, do you know there are protests at home about this war, about what you're about to do? He says, yeah, I, I guess there would be, but that doesn't bother me. Why does it bother you? He says, well, see, in my mind, I think we're going to Baghdad to create an Iraq where people have the freedom to protest. They don't know how to do that right now. They're not allowed to do that. They don't live in a free country. So if they see the freedom we have, maybe that will help create it in the country. What an interview. He wasn't bothered by the protests. He saw them as a positive thing. This young man knew very well how to handle that bear. Hearing his sentiments at that moment, I felt very proud of that young man, that young Christian Marine. Throughout the conflict, I prayed for him. I don't know if he ever came home. I assume he did. And I also prayed that every Christian living in America, be they from military families or not, be they conscientious objectors or not, would learn to see the war as he did. This young man knew how to handle that bear. We could learn much from him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.